popular demand, the profile interview segment will be in two parts this week. I will continue the extended version of the interview I had with uh, Comrade Governor Adams Oshomole and also the current national president of the Nigerian Labour Congress, Comrade Ayubo Waba. They will be discussing several social issues the average Nigerian worker is faced with at the moment. Take a listen. So I would like to ask you, any regrets as the NLT president? Is there anything you think you would have loved to put in place before you left office? Hmm, it's always a difficult question. But the, the, the truth is that there were moments where when I had doubt, when I see things, I'm like, I feel so bad about so many things I saw that I thought government was not doing right and it could be done differently. And occasionally, I, when I see the, the, uh, the determination of government people to get those things done, mm -hmm. I'm like, maybe the problem was with me. Maybe I didn't quite understand because I am this, on this other side. But thanks to God, I have been in government. I'm now much more convinced that I was not totally right. I should have fought evil harder. You know, give it what I now know, have you seen all side of it? You know, that um, we all need to work hard and be each other's policeman and policewoman to ensure that all of us in public office, that we are constantly reminded that we are the people's stewards and that we must, we must ensure that in all that we do, that the overriding immediate to medium and long term objective is public good and public welfare. Now, to get that done, you need a very vigilant and very active citizenry, which is what organized labor is about, which is what some sections, I emphasize some sections of the civil society are also about and working together, they can make that happen and therefore bring more meaning and enrich the real content, you know, the, the real essence of uh, democracy uh, in, in, this, in, in any given society. Now I'm asking this question from my heart as a Nigerian citizen. Um, the standard of living of an average Nigerian worker is actually poor. The national minimum wage has not been revealed. Presently, um, the Trade Union Congress has actually made a statement which is quite worrisome that aside Lagos State government, each state has a particular sum of money in terms of private salary or arrears or pension that they are owing workers. So many things happening across Nigeria. The state, um, Kogi State, for example, we have in Kaduna also the mass hack going on there. Um, before now, we know the way the Nigerian Labour Congress is. Before, whenever an issue comes up like this, we know that if it were you, we know that everyone will be on lockdown and will get results. I'm not against the leadership of the Nigerian Labour Congress. They might have their own challenges, which you might be aware of. But what is your message to an average Niger Nigerian worker who is faced with these challenges? Well, it would be simple that the workers should realize that their job doesn't stop at electing their leaders. It includes policy their leaders and getting their leaders to account. Um, and this has to be, that's why, you know, uh, the slogan of labor is that the struggle continues. And people say, how can it just continue to actually end one day? It cannot end because you see, you must continue to watch, must continue to monitor, must continue to engage. And like I said earlier, I remember I said, the trade unions are funded by their members. They are not living on handout by governments or donation by foreign powers or foreign organizations. They are funded 100% by workers' contribution and therefore they are membership driven and membership funded. And therefore the workers have power over their leaders and leaders hold their office at the pleasure of the workers. So it, the workers just need to show sufficient interest in affairs of their respective unions. If you look at the union constitution, they are there. And there is a, an agency, a unit within the Ministry of Labor that shows that union constitutions are obeyed 
and the workers' right to interrogate their unions, include their finances. Uh, they are supposed to be audited and, and, and forwarded to the Registry of Trade Unions for approval, exactly the same way as a corporate organization is supposed to file audited account with the uh, uh, Corporate Affairs Commission. Um, so, but I think that the, uh, the challenges confronting workers cannot be isolated from the rest of society. There are huge challenges. Um, I mean, every day you open newspaper. But that's why for me, and I'm not apologetic about this, I think President Buhari is rightly doing the right stuff by identifying corruption as the key thing that must be fought without which no TS matters. Of course, people say, now nah, corruption we won't fight, now nah, nah, anti corruption we won't chop. But the truth is, if it has been stolen, you can't get it to chop anyway. Every day you open newspapers, you find new revelations by, and I'm sure they have not touched. 10% of the problem. So the starting point is that as victims, workers as victims of corrupt practices should support this fight and provide the energy because when corruption is fighting back and the, the, the president seems to be alone and you are reading commentaries that says, eh, okay, I did corruption and so what? Oh, I get worried. Because why do you want to keep fetching water and put it into a pot that is leaking? And people say, don't bother that the pot is leaking. Just put more water. It doesn't make common sense. So, but the real other challenge is when you have so much rent seekers and so much money going, bleeding out of the system, it also distorts consumption and discourages hard work and delink reward from effort. And once there is no relationship between effort and reward, young people can see people who are adding no value, who are not working, making so much money. They ask themselves, particularly if these people are also evil illiterate or hardly literate, then they ask themselves, why do I need to burn my candle reading at night? Look at that guy who, just because his uncle, his brother is, a, is a somewhere, somewhere, is making it. So all I need to do is to try and know somebody. And I'll make it. And once more and more people subscribe to these uh, false assumptions about life, mm -hmm. then we are in trouble. So that is why I don't care what anybody says. Uh, and there is no suggestion here that to declare a war and engage to fight the war means that you have won the war. No. But there is no question. We are beginning, we are beginning to see casualties. I think for the first time, huge money is being recovered and the various agencies are explaining how much they have been able to recover that was otherwise already successfully stolen. Yes, the process of prosecution and the number of people convicted might not be as much, but that is not in the hand of the executive. But what is within the discussion of the executive is to identify and as much as possible once they recover, they take it out of these uh, private hands. We are seeing ministers going to court to plead that they won't plead again to return hundreds of millions of naira. I think that this war, every Nigeria should support President Buhari in this fight. And when people say, oh, it's not being done the right way. Okay, first, be in it and help to put it to the right way. But there have be no question that it's a wasted effort. I think the results are outstanding, but that there can be more. Of course, everything can be better. Every aspect of life can be better. And that's why your cameras are getting better. Your picture quality is getting better. From HD ready, now you have HD. I don't know what the next one will be. I can't think of anything that, that cannot be better, right? But that everything, I mean, something is not at its best, it's not an argument for not supporting it. There's this perception that um, if we elect labor leaders in the private sector, that they would perform better if, than if they're from the public sector. How true is this? Well, <clears throat> you know I come from the private sector, um, and I think 
other the NFC, uh, the current NFC at 40, and probably the only one who had come from the private sector. Uh, maybe the difference is that, obviously, when you work in the public service, you talk about circulars and regulations and the disciplinary code is far more protective of the civil servants and so on. In the private sector, the rules are more stringent and the supervisory mechanism is, I think, more effective and so on. So if you go through this process, of course, your worldview will be uh, perhaps a little different. But I don't think that is enough to make all the difference. Um, on the other hand, being in public service, enables the workers who are coming from that sector to understand governance because they push the files. They can see how some things are hidden. When they say someone is sitting on somebody's file, I understand from my colleague in the civil service that it can be real. They just take the file and put it under the cushion and sit on it. And that is, it is unlikely that anybody will go and check a messenger's seat to find it. So only a public servant, uh, somebody from public background can understand that. But I don't think the character of our employer is enough to shape the level of courage that we have, our knowledge, and our capacity to engage. I think that has to do with individuals. It is not a function of whether you are employed in the private or the public sector. In the last two years, Nigerian workers have actually been going through a lot because lots of states are not paying salaries as that when due. Despite the bailout fund, we still have lots of states not paying workers' salaries as that when due. What's your take on this? Uh, let me try to put the issue into context with facts. It is true that uh, at the inception in 2015, uh, just after or before the general election, because we also know some of the causes. Some of the causes has to do with some of our governors serving out, and uh, the treasury was emptied for the purpose of prosecuting uh, either the election of 2015 or some of them that are serving out actually emptied the treasury. Some also obtained loans, and therefore, uh, coupled with the issue of uh, what they uh, now try to hide under, the issue of uh, uh, falling price of uh, crude oil, but clearly it's mismanagement. There have been mismanagement, and that's why we're in this quack near. About 22 states were not able to pay salary. And uh, we raised the issue that for a worker to have worked and is not being paid, there is no reason to justify that situation. And clearly speaking, we kept that agitation and we had made the point that no reason is good enough to justify why workers and pensioners are not being paid. And that's how the issue of the bailout came about. It was uh, towards addressing this very bad situation that the issue of bailout came about and even budget support to states. States collected resources, enormous resources in trillions. Some were able to justify the use of those resources and it was committed to the issue of payment of worker salary. Clear example is just Plateau State. We are before the inception of the present governor. We had about seven months liability of salaries and some other payments. He used that money judiciously and cleared everything. Now they are at no arrears. While some states or receive of that money also help themselves through very corrupt tendencies. They award white elephant project and the issue and the problem is still lingering. So the clear point here of departure is the political will to do the right thing in the face of this daunting challenge. Yes, the federal government have assisted in giving out bailout and including some reform of Paris Club, including some budget support. But out of those, 10 states at present still are in a very bad situation. Uh, because if you cannot be able to pay workers' salary as and when due, and also pay pensioners, or where you have arrears, we should be able to list you under states that have not been able to address the issue. So clearly from where we are coming, we have made some progress, but we are not yet there. And clearly speaking, this is why we have been up and doing. We also have listed their names. We said, name them and shame them. We also said, those that have done well, let us also recognize them and encourage them. States like Sokoto, no areas at all. States like Katina, no areas at all. Many of them, which we have listed them, we have named them. Those that have done well, we have encouraged them, we have appreciated them. 
those that have also helped themselves with the bailout, including the fact that ICPC mentioned states that diverted even the bailout. But here we are, when we have said they should be prosecuted, that investigation must go in to see how those funds are utilized. That brings us to the point of whether the problem of Nigeria is about resources or mismanagement. And clearly from what has happened, from what I've been able to gather, it's about mismanagement. We have no reason whatsoever to be in this situation where we are in. We are workers and Nigerians. The inequality gap have continued to widen between the rich and the poor. Clearly, we, know, we have no reason to be where we are. And that's why we must link some of those challenges to where we are. And uh, also the quality of our political aid, because we must also support people that see workers as a priority, not as a liability. Workers are an asset to any country. And therefore, we must situate those people that see workers as a liability and separate them from those people that see workers as a liability. They are said that see workers as a liability. Kaduna, for instance, he sees workers as a liability. And that's why he wanted to obtain a World Bank loan. And then he wanted to reduce the workforce by 50% uh, under different guises using and hiding under the issue of competency test for teachers. He has earmarked 21,000. In the local government, he said he wanted to do reform because there is no justification he can attach to that of local government. He said reform. He has been dismissing workers uh, from what we had, about 5,000 now. Then from ministries, departments, agencies, including the institution, he's earmarking about 8,000 workers. No justification. Outside the fact that he's a core capitalist that doesn't believe in the value of workers. He doesn't believe in the rule of law. And these are the situations we are confronted with. And therefore, we must continue to engage the issue. We must continue to expose them so that people will know them. You remember in 2012, when we were having a protest here in Abuja, it was the same person that was pleading that let's accommodate him in our van because he believes in the struggle of the working class. But today, we are seeing their real color. And that's why we are engaging the system. We are evaluating people that we think we can support on the basis of where they are coming from and what they have been able to deliver to us. You can't use semantics. We don't have industries. Our youth are unemployed. And um, there's so many things to be done by the government of the day. So I would like to ask you, what's your take on this? Well, it has been an issue that NLC have been very consistent in raising. There is no way you can create jobs without industries. All over the world, where the issue of unemployment has been addressed, it has been a combined effort between the uh, non-governmental sector, that is the private sector of the economy, and then government. But government must create the enabling environment for our industries to thrive. You remember when we were in Lagos with Manufacturers Association, we protested the issue of incessant hike in the cost of power. Power is central to the issue of industrialization in Nigeria. Most companies in Nigeria that have folded and moved to other countries is because power is not there and it's expensive. They maintain their generators. They also have to pay a very high tariff. That cannot take us anywhere. And I think this is deliberate. When we say government cannot manage business, it's because of the type of system we have. We have countries around the world that government is still managing business and they are doing well in the UK. The power sector is still under government control. South Africa. Today, the largest power plant is being built by Ethiopia. They have the best airline around the world. It's managed by government. So it's a systemic problem. It has nothing to do with private or public. You remember our banks that are essentially private. We had to support them with government funds, our funds, to bail them out. So there is nothing to say that you have to be either private or public for uh, those processes to be driven. No. The primary purpose of governance is the welfare and well-being of the people. And therefore, government must drive the policy of welfare and well-being of the people. We must develop, uh, we must drive developmental processes. Government must be at the helm of affairs. So two reasons are actually at the center of all of this. We have not prioritized making sure that our industries are able to produce for our domestic consumption. That is a major challenge. And because of that, we have actually transported all our jobs. 
Our jobs are outside the country because we solely depend on finished products, including textile. You see, many Nigerians today, if you look at what they are wearing, is actually exporting our jobs. We have the very old good days. We are in the context of Nigeria. We have thousands and thousands of textile companies working and generating jobs, millions of jobs. Today, they are gone because one, unfavorable business environment, high tax for the businesses, even when they cannot be able to produce. So people would prefer to actually import than to produce. Look at even oil and gas, for instance. For more than 30 years, we have been doing the oil and oil gas business. We are the only country among OPEC countries that cannot refine product for our domestic use. That is the starting point. We kill the refineries deliberately. It will, there will be turnaround maintainers today. Tomorrow somebody will go and put spanner into it and spoil it. Because it is easier for businesses to import and sell. They make quick money. There is inherent corruption in it. So nobody wants the refinery to work because if the refinery works, corruption will have ended. This is the truth of the matter. And that's all we can take on this episode of Labor Lens. Join us next week for a fresh edition of the show. I am Sharon Ijasson. Thanks for watching and remember, labor creates wealth.